Great. So we're going to start uh, with the role of the speech language pathologist, and then uh, Don will be speaking about the occupational therapist role. So you can go to the next. Yeah. Just, you know, the things I really want to talk about are just understanding the different areas that we treat and assess for kind of the differential diagnosis that um, I look at when I there's a question of autism and our role in this process. So we assess for and treat a lot of different areas. I think sometimes people think speech therapists just work on speech, but we work on many different things. Um, we assess for and look at language disorders. Those can be spoken or written. It can be receptive or expressive deficits, things like aphasia. Obviously we look at social pragmatic communication and all of the things that fall under that. Um, we address speech sound disorders. Those can be articulation or phonological disorders. We look for apraxia and dysarthria. Um, we look at prosodic differences, the tone stress, loudness and pausing um, of speech. And obviously those are some of the things we see with autism. We look at voice disorders, fluency and stuttering, cognitive deficits, um, feeding and swallowing issues. Um, and hearing impairment or auditory processing issues. Next slide. Um, you know, specifically to autism, what we're assessing for and treating, we're looking at that joint attention piece, their social emotional reciprocity, their social cognition, kind of how they're interpreting um, and understanding the social world around them, different language impairments, they may have delayed or impaired acquisition of language. Um, differences in their use and understanding of nonverbal and verbal communication. They can have vocal development differences. Sometimes this is where we'll see kind of that um, odd intonation and things like that. There's symbolic play differences, conversation differences. They can have literacy differences. Um, and then obviously executive functioning differences. Um, we also take a look at their behavioral and emotional challenges. There can be a lot of challenges that we see related to not being able to talk and be able to get your wants and needs met and be able to interact with the people around you. Um, and then we take a look at sensory uh, and feeding challenges as well. So as far as assessment and differential diagnosis, the things that I keep in my mind when I'm seeing a kid who's been referred um, for you know, a question of autism or social communication disorder, where we're seeing those differences you know, with the absence of kind of the RRBs, um, selective mutism. I see lots of kids who've been referred for ASD evaluations, and, and this can be a thing that's going on. Obviously, we're looking at autism. We want to make note of these social differences that we can see in kids with trauma and neglect or abuse history, like the kiddo we talked about today. Um, understanding cultural differences with the family. Um, and we just want to be able to do you know, I'm a big believer in these multi-team assessments. It's part of what I do. Um, they're just comprehensive. So you can take a look at the whole child. We make a lot of referrals. You know, families are reporting a lot of different things to us when we do our histories, um, things that come up during the treatment process. So we may be referring for hearing evals. We know that our kiddos with autism deal more with sleep disturbance, GI issues. Um, with constipation and diarrhea and feeding things. Um, neurology, I've seen lots of kids that are experiencing seizures. Um, we'll refer for genetic testing. Your nose and throat specialists, I make that referral a lot. I have kids with nasality issues or enlarged tonsils that I refer on. We have, um, we refer for be behavioral intervention and counseling to support the patient and family, and then for psych or neuropsych testing if we think something else is going on. So, you know, language disorders in our ASD population, the NIH estimates about 63% of kids diagnosed with ASD will have language impairments. And these language impairments can affect their social and pragmatic language development, and their use and understanding of social language. And with our ASD kiddos, we can see kind of unique differences in the vocabulary that they're using, the grammar that they're using. They can have that odd or formal language use or idiosyncratic language use or just difficulty using language for a variety of different things. Um, I just thought this was interesting. This study took a look at the differences between boys and girls kind of on the playground. 
Um, it noted that girls with ASD stay in closer proximity to their peers, better able to capitalize on kind of those social um, opportunities. They spend more time in joint engagement, spend more time talking. And they're better able to use compensatory behaviors, especially when they're younger, to gain access into their peer groups. And with boys, we tend to see that they'll play alone rather than participating in organized games. They may spend more time alone and just spend more time wandering as a primary activity. Um, as I said before, I think it's really important to get a big picture look at these kids when they have multiple things going on. It really helps inform um, their plan of care. Um, I look at every psych report when I'm seeing a kid. I look through that information. I look at their cognitive abilities, their adaptive functioning, because it helps me know what these kids can work on. And whether a child's been diagnosed with ASD or not, or any other neurodevelopmental condition, they can be engaged in therapeutic services. So for treatment, it's just important to know where they're at cognitively and language-wise, so we can you know, effectively treat them with our interventions. We want treatment to be family-centered, and we use lots of different treatment modalities. I listed some of the ones kind of we do with kids with autism, but obviously AAC, visual schedule, sign language, computer and video modeling, um, ESDM, and lots of different social communication interventions, play therapies. Really the role um, of a speech pathologist is just you know, we want to complete a very thorough assessment and determine our goals and treatment modalities. Um, I think it's really important to understand the differences between boys and girls with ASD, because that can look and present differently through their lifespan. Um, different cultural differences. We want to refer for other services or specialties, because like I said, lots of different issues will be brought up by the family, things they're experiencing. Um, collaboration with other services. Some of the best work I've done in my career is when I've worked with occupational and physical therapists. I love them with counselors, with behavioral interventionists, um, and working with the schools to make sure everybody's kind of on the same page. Um, part of what we do is educate families and caregivers about sleep, speech, and language development and about autism and the different services that are out there. And really, it's just to be an advocate for the child and their family, teach them how to advocate for their child. Um, for how to help parents, super important. It seems like everyone would be doing this, but you want to empower people, empower them in this process and understand where a family is at. We have parents come in to our clinic in all different states. Some of them are anxious, some of them are curious, some of them want validation for what's been going on, and some of them are in a grieving process. Um, and we just want to be present, be with them in those moments. You want to check in with them about how the child and how they themselves are doing. Spend time just talking to them about life. I don't make everything about like autism or all of the hard things. We talk about the good things too. We want to be able to offer resources. Um, I ask them what goals they want to work on. You know, we complete these assessments and we have all these goals that we want to work on as speech therapists, but the family may have something really important to them that they want included as part of that. Um, really important to set goals and measure progress and outcomes and just to come alongside the family to support them. Families can be engaged in therapy in many different ways um, and it can change. So really the things, and I had to, there's a lot I could talk about <laughs> as Lindsay and I were talking about with speech therapy, but um, I think it's, what we do is just, we're very skilled at assessing and treating social pragmatic language and assessing for autism. We have training in this. I know lots of speech therapists that are good at this. Um, I would ask you to act early, early intervention, the first sign of concern, improve the outcomes for these children. You know, often this study was talking about how parents will notice these differences in their child's development um, and socialization, 14 months of age, sometimes younger. They're gonna start asking questions. Please answer those questions. Please refer them to get a look at these things. Um, it never hurts to take a look when there's a question or a concern. I would love for families, I love when families come in and we take a look and we're like, everything's, kind of on track, everything's looking good. 
um, or it lets us know too and we need to follow these kids a little more closely. Um, the last thing, Lindsay, after, will you go to the next slide? Let me see. There's my references. And then I wanted to talk just for a second. Yeah, so um, the CDC has a lot of really great information for families. They have a milestone checker app that's available in English and Spanish that families can use. They have milestone checklists. I have parents print off checklists, keep them at home, mark what kids are doing and what they aren't doing so we can kind of track that. Um, but there's lots of good resources out there that you can direct parents to. And now let Dawn go. <laughs> Thank you, that was great. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna be talking about um, the role of occupational therapy for with kids and uh, with autism and um, specifically with that younger population like we've been talking about today. You can go on to the next slide. Um, learning objectives, um, we're just gonna identify what OT can address, kind of like what Jamie did, and talk about how OT intervention works and what we do to help the children, and then talk about when a referral would be appropriate as well. So next. All right, um, I feel like most people know this, but I always, you never know. So I just want to say, where can we get OT from? And there, there are a variety of places you can get them. Like when they're in the NICU, there's OTs working in there, or if they're just an inpatient in a hospital, in the pediatric hospital. We've mentioned the infant toddler program, um, developmental preschool, they'll get, they can get OT and speech services there. And, or they can get it even from an outpatient clinic, like where I work. So um, there's all kinds of places they can get it, especially if, like we talked about, um, there's wait lists and it's hard getting into different services. And so I kind of all often recommend families just kind of get their hands in as many areas as they can. And then um, if they get in multiple places, great, because that means that's more, that many more people that are have their eyes on the child and are, and are working with them. So, um, all right, next slide. Um, so with kids with autism, they can result in difficulties with communication, as we talked about, social skills. They have restricted interests, repetitive behaviors. Um, lots of sensory processing concerns. They have motor skills um, that are delayed or they just have a hard time with coordinating different motor movements and they struggle with different adaptive behaviors with like self-care skills or um, like, like dressing and eating and those kind of things. So next slide, please. Um, so what does OT address? I, um, thought that this quote from the American Occupational Therapy Association just kind of summed it all together. So it says, in young children with autism, occupational therapists often focus on enhancing children's sensory processing, sensory motor performance, social behavioral performance, self-care, and participation in play. In older children and adolescents, occupational therapy goals may focus on social and behavior performance, transitions to work, and independence in community. So Basically, we work on everything. <laughs> I love OT because it is, it's such a broad field. And for, in most instances, it's something that OT can address. And if not, we refer out and we, we have a lot of um, people that we know can help in those areas that we're not, we're not as good at. So um, next, please. So for motor development, um, kids with autism um, often struggle with like motor imitation skills. So um, they're, they're not able to imitate that movement, um, like an example I like to give is I weren't worked with a kid one time that he saw kids rolling down a hill and he wanted to roll down the hill, but he could not do it. He just physically didn't know how to get his body in a position to roll down a hill. Um, you know, another one was a kid wanted to sit on a scooter, um, like those square ones, you know, we had in elementary school and he, he didn't know how to like sit down and get on it. And so it's, those are things that sound simple in our minds, but are actually quite a complex motor thing. Um, so we often work on that motor coordinating thing to be able to get those simple. And those are same motor skills are needed to do everyday activities like brushing your teeth or playing with your toys. Um, if they're not able to imitate those motor movements, then it's going to make those activities really difficult for them. Um, and <clears throat> or use the different tools in classrooms, like I mentioned there, or even helping out at home if they want them to help with like chores or anything like that. This is going to make it really tricky. Next. Um, adaptive behaviors, they, they um, are clearly demonstrated with children with autism. 
Um, OTs, we address toileting and any aspect of that. Um, Mealtime behaviors, whether that's just having them sit at the table or is it the eating aspect or the, if they're um, sensory concerns with their food, we all, all of that. Um, other aspects of self-care, are they uh, brushing their teeth, taking a bath? Do they tolerate it? Are there problems when they try to do it? Can they get dressed by themselves? Um, household chores, um, younger kids don't have as many household chores usually, but they can help around the house. And there are things that they, they should be able to help with. And so we, we help address that, especially as they get older. And participating in leisure activities. For most kids, that's playing. Playing is an activity for kids. And so we work a lot on those play skills. Like, are they able just to play with their toys? Can they, are, um, are they able to play um, with, with people around them? Do they play games? Can they follow the rules? All those kind of things. Um, handwriting, um, again, that's more older skills, but in younger skill, younger kids, we look at those pre-writing um, shapes, like are they able to draw shapes? Do they, are they even interested in scribbling, that kind of thing? And so many other things that we also address. Next, please. Um, so sensory differences in autism. Um, this is a tricky one that, because sensory affects a lot of different areas, um, a lot of different diagnoses and not just autism, but um, there have been found some differences with people with autism. So one study found 39% of children with autism were under responsive, meaning um, it took a lot more before they they registered some kind of sensory input, whether that was noise or um, you know temperatures, that kind of thing. 20% uh, of children with autism were hypersensitive, meaning they didn't take that much um, before they were effective by something. And 36% of children show a mixed pattern of responses. Um, so it, it just kind of varies. And in one of the resources, I, I uh, linked a survey that they did over a, with a, I can't remember how many people it included, but it compared people with autism to neurotypical. And it was really interesting to see like the different sensory areas and like where, where one was more sensitive than the other. So if you're interested, um, I found that interesting. But on the next slide, we're gonna talk more about sensory stuff. So how do OTs assess sensory differences? Um, we do a lot of parent-teacher report um, and we have sensory questionnaires. And I really like these. There's a couple of different options out there and not just OTs can use them. You can, you can also use the sensory questionnaires as well. But I like them because often there are areas of things that the parents haven't thought about that could be sensory things. Like in today's case, um, they mentioned that there probably wasn't that many sensory concerns, but I imagine there's probably more than what the mom or dad is thinking. Like if they were to go through and start answering questions, they're like, oh yeah, like just in general, like the food, the eating stuff. I'm like, well, they, it seems like there's might be some some sensitivity with the different foods that they like. But I mean, we just have a brief snapshot of that. Um, and then we also just observe them. Um, it's it's funny during a session or during the evaluation, I often get a good idea of different sensory things that the kids like. You know, whether they're constantly running and jumping into stuff because they love that crashing input, um, like my sensory seekers, I call them, or some of my kids, I can tell if they're visually seeking, if they're constantly looking out of the corner of their eye, you know, or they're trying to look at things in different ways. So um, observation is a great one for also looking at those sensory things. And on the next slide, um, I kind of was talking about this, but from our sensory questionnaires, it kind of gives us a bigger picture. I like this visual where it shows us, it can tell us if, if they're sensory seekers, if they have higher if it have a high registration, if it takes a lot more before they recognize that sensory or if they're low. Um, often with sensory, I like to think of it as having different size of cups and it can vary. So with movement, they could have a large 40 ounce cup and it just, then no matter how much movement they're putting in there, it's just not filling up, right? They're, they have a high threshold for that. Um, whereas for some kids, they, they might have a smaller cup so um, maybe it's for sound. And so the slightest sound um, is going to fill that little cup really fast. And then they're going to be starting to cry whenever they hear the hair dryer or when they hear um, the toilet flushing, things like that. Um, so uh, anyway, we can you can look at this more, but I just really like it because it's just helpful information for us to know where and where to help each of these kids. And especially like I mentioned um, these are gonna vary with different sensory areas. And so that's what makes kids so tricky is because um, they, they're they not gonna be 
high across the board and everything is going to vary and how you treat it varies too. And what's hard is that what might work one day, it won't work another day. If you just think of ourselves personally, right? One day I might want to cuddle up in a blanket and the next day that I'm like, nope, I need to listen to music. That's going to help me feel better. And so that's always something to keep in mind as well. So next slide, please. Um, how do we address the different sensory differences? We talk about environmental changes, um, if that's possible, um, trying to make it, if it's in at home, is their room too busy? That can be distressing for kids. You know, do we need to change how they're sitting at the dinner table so that, that there's less um, distractions so they can focus on eating? Um, if, if you can't always change the environment, like in classrooms, that's not always possible. So we have to come up with a different options. Predictability for some kids, just knowing that there's something's gonna be coming up, like, oh, I'm gonna turn the blender on, that's enough to help them. Um, it might give them a chance to go to a different room or they're just prepared so they're not gonna get startled. Um, starting slow and building. So if they don't like to have their hands dirty, I'm not gonna immediately bring them in and like shove their hands in like the gooeyest texture you can think of. Um, I'll start slow by by addressing, maybe just getting them used to, to playing with like more drier materials like sand or corn and then slowly building them up to a wetter texture, that kind of thing. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but teaching them how to escape from non-preferred activities in a, in a correct way. Not that we want them to always be running, um, but like I said, do they need noise canceling headphones? Can they go into the other room while there's something going on? Do they just need to go to the calming corner or take a break from something and then they'll be able to come back into the activity? Um, so uh, I'm not gonna read these, these quotes, but, based, but they're kind of talking about how um, if you're looking for evidence on sensory integration and like using sensory processing, it's really hard to find solid evidence based practices on it because there's just not as many um, research done on it. So I, I know it works because I use it in my thing, right? I see how mo increased movement can help a kid calm down and be able to focus on something. I see how, you know, exposure to different things is going to help build his tolerance for having messy hands. Um, but it's just hard to find the evidence for that. So it's just the place that we need can do to do continued research in. Um, but I, I feel like it is very effective to, to address sensory processing. Um, just really quickly regarding sensory processing disorder, um, it's not an official diagnosis in the DSM-5 OTs. We can't diagnose it. We actually don't do any diagnosis of anything. We can only um, use other people's diagnoses. But I, it's a very real thing. And when parents bring it up, I don't diss it. I know that there's definitely a lot of children out there with lots of sensory concerns and things like that. Um, I just never, I just can't tell them this is what it is. I'm just like, yep, your child has a lot of, um, and sometimes we get reports from, from doctors that do say that they have sensory processing disorder and that's fine. Um, but, but just recognize that it's not an actual official diagnosis the way we see it. Next, please. Um, our OT interventions um, oftentimes look just like we're playing and we get that comment a lot when they're like, you're just playing with the kids. But that's how we play. That's how we help them. Um, so through playing, playing games and doing crafts, we work on all these different skills. So we work on developing, you know, those play-based skills and that social skills. We work on executive functioning skills and um, social emotional, a lot of self-regulation stuff. And we work on educating the parents a lot and giving them I, things they can do at home to help their child. And we also do a lot of sensory integration, sensory-based interventions, like I mentioned earlier. Next. Um, and then just briefly, what a typical OT session looks like. Normally they're 45 to 60 minutes long. Every once in a while, you'll find a clinic that only does 30 minute sessions. I personally prefer slightly longer sessions because um, it's just easier for the child. Um, but in that, we're gonna provide in-home supports and adaptations for the parents. We work on that parent education training them. Um, sometimes we don't always have the parents come back with us, but we will often, if we need them to um, see how to do something with their child or to help them see how we address different things. And then we also do a lot of tax, task performance and intervention. So we use modeling, chaining, those kind of things to help them to work on whatever goal they're looking at, whether that is let's practice brushing our teeth, let's practice following directions, you know, let's practice um, drawing, that kind of thing. Next, 
And um, last is like when to refer to OT. Um, again, pretty much, um, I never feel bad or get mad if someone refers to me. Like Jamie says, I love it when I, someone comes in and I'm like, you know what, these are, these are great concerns, but your child's actually doing really well and I don't have any further concerns for them. But if you have any concerns with any fine or visual motor skills, um, adaptive skills, um, sensory differences, school participation, feeding, oral motor concerns, behaviors, any self-regulation concerns, anything like that, we are happy to see them and, we'd be, and, and to evaluate them and to figure out how we can best help them to meet their needs. And I think, <clears throat> there you go, one more. Um, just some key points, um, just as a refresher, is that we are, as OTs, are skilled at assessing and treating all kinds of areas. Um, I'm not gonna list them all again, but um, we do a variety of areas. So please refer to us, reach out if you have questions, um, and we're always happy to help. So thank you. Oh, thank you for that, great. And, and Jamie, thank you for uh, the your tag team uh, uh, presentation uh, today. We have about 10 minutes for, for questions. Uh, and there were some questions in the chat um, that have been partially, at least partially responded to. Let me, uh, Jamie, I have a question for you. Um, I think it has to do with uh, with kids, kids with ASD who may uh, be uh, in speech therapy. And it, it seems, this is an exaggeration, but it seems like sometimes the, the way to build vocabulary in students is to, I'll, I'll kind of, mentioned the, the tried and true, you know, hold up a picture, uh, say the say the name of the object uh, to build vocabulary. But for kids who might not have adequate joint attention yet, um, there seems to be a sequence uh, that in, that therapists might need to work on in order to more rapidly uh, see the child respond for development of vocabulary and the use of language. What has been your experience with kind of how to approach and what clinicians can ask of the parents when in follow-up to determine if they have the best match, uh, the best kind of a, a therapist who understands autism and the, the emergence of language, uh, including you know the, the emergence of joint attention? Well, how do you respond to that? Uh, do we have 20 minutes? <laughs> um, <laughs> such a huge question. It's always, they do have difficulty with that correspondence with pictures. Um, I often ask parents if they, kids are looking at books and doing things like that. It's, as a speech therapist, you have to know when to take a step back, how to scaffold these kids and where to start from. It's always easier to start with objects with kids. So I tell parents a lot, if they can't do books and things like that, always have objects out. And I start with things that the kid's interested in, right? So like the kid we were talking about with cars and balls, I would use those objects. I would have different, all different kinds of those objects, all different kinds of cars, build on the, their vocabulary in that way. Lots of kids with autism are good at labeling. They're good at naming things. That's oftentimes the language that they do have is to label things in their environment. So I have worked from that perspective of like working with the actual tactile thing in front of them. I've had better luck with that than working on just pictures. Um, and then they usually can move on to that. But yeah, you want to have a speech therapist that has experience treating kids with autism that understands these differences. A lot of these little kiddos are working from a pre-linguistic phase of language development, that pre-symbolic so there's things to work on before they're going to be able to do some of those other things. Understanding basic turn taking, understanding how to attend to things. A lot of times kids with autism have lacked the ability to even know what to pay attention to. So I find things that are super motivating to them. Bubbles is a huge one and start working from there on building that language. That's perfect. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, there was another question that, uh, that uh, Joe Johnson asked about um, maybe an older level one ASD student mm -hmm. whose uh, fixated interest is on talking yes. and, and yet maybe uh, lacking some uh, pragmatic language skills. 
how can uh, what what evaluations and therapeutic options might be available? So for those, those are my favorite kids. I love the talkers because um, <laughs> I'm a talker. Um, <laughs> I do the social language development test. I think it gives really great information um, about where these kids are functioning. Girls, and I don't like to make general statements, but I will. Girls are typically talking more. The part of you know social interaction that they lack is regulating that, knowing how much they can say and paying attention to the nonverbal communication of their communication partner. So yes, I refer kids all the time for social skills groups and to individually work on some of those social skills. That's terrific. Let's see, are there, uh, uh, are there if there are other questions, please unmute and go ahead and ask your question. Be happy to entertain. I have a question for you, Jamie. Yeah. There's such a lack of um, SLPs and, and often OTs in rural areas, especially up here in northern Idaho. What's your take on the effectiveness of telehealth for kiddos um, versus having someone live in front of them? Um, in, I sometimes think kids with autism working on tele, in telehealth do a little bit better sometimes when you're initially working on some of that stuff. We got to figure this out during COVID, right? Started doing a lot of telehealth stuff. We were doing social skills group stuff online. Um, sometimes it's less intimidating for them to work on some of this stuff through telehealth, which I thought was interesting and nice to find out. I like to do things in person. I think it's important to you read more things when you're in a room with somebody some of that stuff, I think you can work on telehealth, but I think the most valuable thing is to have people in a room. There's a lot that happens when you're with other people. Piggy bank on that, or piggyback on that. I just say that it just varies on the child as far as OT. There are a lot of OTs that do telehealth therapy and it works great, but um, for me, I had a mixed bag. Some of my clients, when we switched for COVID, worked great and others not so well, especially if I was working on behaviors with them, right? It's really easy just to close the computer or it's easy just to run and hide behind the couch. And I have no authority of whether or not they're going to come out from behind the couch during their session. So um, I think telehealth is a great option, like you said, especially for those rural areas, but it just kind of depends on the client and, and it, it's a good fit for them specifically. I had a, a quick question re regarding um, speech therapy for bilingual families, mm -hmm. where um, often child times, depending on the age of the child, the child is advanced more in English than the family. Mm -hmm. And at, at what point do you recommend um, switching from maybe a Spanish-based therapy into English-based therapy or not? I think once the kiddos are in school, if the majority of their day is spent as an English language learner, um, then I will start to move things that direction. Um, but it's really up to the family. <laughs> I think it's that can be tricky to navigate sometimes. Um, and I think it's important to have a bilingual therapist because you want the communication and the relationship with that family um, to be able to talk to them about the goals, to be able to talk through all of that stuff. So. Yeah, that's tricky. Um, I see there's a question about a list of social skills groups. I would love to see a list of social skills groups. There's lots of agencies doing them. Our agency does them. I know that there's social skills stuff happening at other agencies um, in the Valley. Um, yeah, it's really important. It's important for these kids, especially once they've done individual therapy, it's a nice gen way to generalize their skills into something to move them into those social groups. And 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 those were those agencies often had to just shut down all social skill groups yeah. during the pandemic. And yep. it'd be interesting to know kind of how the community, how the state has responded and where those social skill groups are, because I think um I think we need to start identifying them and referring kids. For participation. Great. That's really a great comment, Jamie. Thank you. 
A lot of schools, I will say too, a lot of schools have friendship groups, they call them, which can be a nice um, mm -hmm. way to get those kids at least working with peers on things if they can't get in for speech and language therapy or they can't get in for social skills groups like at clinics and stuff. That's the route I've taken sometimes when there's no other route. <laughs> I I would echo that, Jamie. I think the difficulty across our mental health agencies and and uh, developmental uh, agencies or DDAs and such to keep groups going on a continual basis and and just to where you all have a direction of, or a resource at least within the area that you're in. The only thing that we have that's consistent like that is the school. Uh, yeah. And different schools will have, sometimes our school counselor will create kind of these social uh, mentorship kind of programs. Sometimes they'll have just some out uh, after school activities. Uh, that's, I think, also an important aspect when we're looking at these littles, littles being these, you know, preschool kiddos, getting them into early preschool uh, and into these agencies to help begin that social uh, uh, connection and then just have those kind of social groups where they're social, they're structured and uh, given um, support to be able to interact and, and learn these things uh, from individuals that are, are trained and and understand the process of development. Yes. Travis, would you say it's kind of easier said than done to get these social skills groups up and running, especially if you're a billing entity and you have various kids with var various different stages of development, you have to make sure they're gonna meld together and it's gonna be a good group. You also have to make sure that they're willing to come in consistently um, and also in, in what, and what level they are at in their intervention. Like some kids need still need individualized intervention. So it's a huge, it's, I think it's a delicate balance and a delicate dance. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just hard. I think any inter, any agency that's doing evidence-based social skills intervention is, is good. And I think, I think we mentioned the peers program out at UCLA and there's probably others that I haven't been completely on top of as of late. <laughs> Um, but if anybody else has any recommendation, recommendations, I think Amy said something like social talk, social thinking.com. Um, so thinking. yeah, without, ha you know, having a university think tank close by to help really, uh, develop those things. I think it's a little bit harder to no be up, up to, up to par in terms of, um, what exactly is, is, is working and how it's being translated in, into the community. I noticed we're right at our cutoff time. I want to uh, thank uh, Alicia for presenting our case today and, and, and Don and Jamie for a, a great presentation and, and questions to follow. Uh, let me hand it back over to Lindsay to close us today. Thank you so much, team. Um, we're going to meet again next uh, November 9th from 12.30 to 1.30. So note it's a slightly different time um, for our stat cohort we'll actually have a QI meeting, so the session is only an hour. The topic is anxiety, autism, and medication use. Will be presented by our panelist, Elena Harla Duhl. Um, she has a PhD and um, pediatric neuropsychologist, and her colleague, Casey Knudsen, who is a DO and adolescent psychiatrist, both from St. Luke's Children's Hospital. So we hope to see you November 9th. If you have any questions or follow-up comments, you can always reach out and email us directly. Thank you so much. Take care.